Leslie Shane Hogan from the Central Coast was serving time for malicious wounding, while Patrick Michael Goonan of Sydney was in for assault and rob. Goonan was due for release in four years, Hogan in two. They were seen on the sports oval at around two o'clock yesterday afternoon. Two hours later, their disappearance was discovered. They'd escaped through a hole in the fence. Just from the cuts that are on the steel, that it looks like the cuts have, could have been from the outside. The escape route taken by the pair is just around the corner from that used by another escapee just two weeks ago. With the two nearby guard towers now unmanned, both breakouts appear to have revealed a weakness in the security system. A concern is a slope in the land near the fence. They could quite easily be unaccounted for just by being down beside the fence there and they just can't be seen from the, the level of the oval. Staffing the towers is inappropriate in a minimum security setting and um, as far as highlighting a weakness is concerned um, it's just part of the, uh, the difficulties of managing an institution. Police spent today searching the area and interviewing inmates and relatives. Detective Townley has urged anyone citing the men not to approach them and contact police immediately. Hogan stands 174 centimetres or 5 foot 9 tall, has a dark complexion and uses the alias Thalen. Goonan is 179 centimetres tall, has dark hair and tattoos on his right arm. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. NIB and Christo Road are new maternity hospitals in Newcastle where privately insured women can have their babies. While about 50 babies have been delivered at Christo Road Hospital in the last month, only three have been delivered at NIB since it opened two months ago. Anne Bartlett is about to have her first baby. Well, I was originally going to go to the um, NIB centre, um, but Dr Holland um, wasn't delivering there, so I've decided to go to Christo Road. Anne's doctor is Michael Holland. Like many other Newcastle obstetricians, he will only deliver babies at Christo Road and the John Hunter, rather than NIB Hospital. Dr Holland says the main reason is many of the doctors have been involved in the development of the new Christo Road Hospital. As far as I know, uh, none of the obstetricians were invited to uh, be involved in the planning of an obstetric unit at NIB. He also claims it would be difficult to attend to women delivering babies in three different hospitals. It's making the establishment of the obstetrics unit a slower process than it would otherwise be. But the service has begun and it's continuing to build. Some women are having their babies at the John Hunter Hospital but then transferring to NIB to rest. Jane Anderson, NBN News.
George Woodcock was found murdered in his house in the Hunter Valley town of Weston more than three years ago. He had received a blow to the neck from a long-bladed instrument. Trevor Allen Burke was questioned by police at the time, but said he was at home with his de facto wife, Judy Dunn. Newcastle Supreme Court heard that last year Miss Dunn told police Burke was not at home with her on the night George Woodcock was murdered. She says he took a machete from the house and came home covered in blood. Miss Dunn told the police she didn't give this evidence earlier because she feared for her life. The accused told police that Judy Dunn was only trying to get back at him because they had split up. The case will continue tomorrow. Jane Anderson, NBN News. While American surgeon Dr. Rick Warland operated on a 69-year-old man who's been suffering from arthritis in his shoulder, a group of Newcastle bone specialists watched on TV in another room at Warners Bay Private Hospital. Dr. Warland was a guest of the Australian Orthopaedic Association in Canberra last week. I stayed on for an additional week to visit five other cities to share some of the experience that we've had with shoulder and knee systems that we're using in the United States. Dr. Warland has designed a joint replacement which is surgically implanted in the patient's shoulder. This particular stem design was not available to them and I came to show them how this is a better way to take care of the same problem. It's claimed the procedure will put an end to the pain and mean a patient will have more movement in their shoulder. The two days of surgery have also had benefits for local doctors. We've compared techniques and uh, learned a lot about um, particularly changes in technology. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Charlestown Square was updated in 1988 to become the region's largest shopping centre with more than 150 specialty shops and five major stores. Recent approval though of a $23 million shopping facility at Glendale has apparently prompted the owners of Charlestown Square, the Lendlease Corporation, to consider expanding the centre. While there are numerous amounts being looked at, it's believed the most likely expenditure is around $30 million and it would be here on the southern side of the facility that the expansion would occur. Lendlease would make no comment today on the possible expansion. However, it's believed the proposal will be going to the next board meeting for approval. Preliminary talks have already been held with Lake Macquarie Council. I have heard that there may be a possibility of the centre expanding sometime uh, in the next 12, 18 months. Uh, it's only, I understand, in preliminary stages. Uh, but uh, I haven't seen any plans specifically. 
While councillors we spoke to would welcome more business in Charlestown, there are concerns about parking and traffic congestion. Mayor John Kilpatrick says they would have to be taken into consideration. At this stage they, uh, they may well be getting preliminary applications together for discussions with the council officers to ensure that uh, obviously the traffic and the parking be very key elements of any expansion. Speculation that Garden City at Katara might also be growing could not be confirmed today. However, owners AMP did say that the recent approval of the Stockland Group's Glendale Centre has prompted the company to look at its situation. Jody McKay, NBN News. This wing of Walzen District Nursing Home will be home for 27 elderly people who suffer from dementia and are known to wander. The residents are being transferred from Morissette Hospital, where they were housed in dormitory-style accommodation. The Walzen unit was designed with their needs in mind. It's better accommodation than what they've got now at Morissette Hospital. Some of the staff from Morrisett Hospital is also moving to Walls End to care for the elderly. Director of Nursing Lynn Moore says the residents won't be as isolated as they were at Morrisett. A lot of the relatives live up this way and so they'll be a lot closer for visiting purposes. Meanwhile, area health boss Dr Tim Smythe says more surgery will be done at Belmont Hospital to reduce the waiting time for ear, nose and throat surgery. Jane Anderson, NBN News. On May 11 this year, 21-year-old Peter Kildarth and 27-year-old Anthony Barnes robbed the news agency at Broadmeadow and the Windale Post Office. Both times, staff were threatened with a sawn-off rifle. They were captured by police after a chase through bushland at Charlestown. In Newcastle District Court today, the pair was sentenced to 12 years jail for the armed robberies, which were committed while they were on the run from Southport Watch House in Queensland. Replying as to why they escaped from Southport, both said they were in need of heroin. Counsel for the pair, Colin Baker, said to Kilduff, how would you describe your condition? Kilduff replied, I was hanging out. What do you mean by that? Kilduff, I needed a shot. Their heroin addictions, which were described in court as severe, were also given as reasons for the armed robberies. The $150 stolen from the news agency, not enough to support Barnes's daily habit. The pair will be eligible for parole in the year 2002. Jody McKay, NBN News. A cruise on Lake Macquarie was a long way from Ray Chappell's drought-stricken electorate of the Northern Tablelands, but his thoughts were firmly fixed on the devastating dry. The Minister says a drought is not just a problem for farmers, it's also a disaster for small business. As the cash flows slow to a trickle for those on the land, less money is spent in cities. When a serious drought hits, the whole community of the state suffers. But there was more promising news for small business people, with Mr Chappell explaining the new retail leases legislation that became law this week. It aims to keep conflict between leasees and leasors out of the courts. They usually ended up in long, protracted, costly dispute, and we think we've found a way now of building better leasing practice right across the industry. The visit also coincided with a $40,000 grant for Toronto's Main Street program. The state government gave $15,000. The rest of the money will be provided over the next two years. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. The fire started in the garage of this weatherboard house in Boundary Street, Maryland. The flames quickly engulfed the two cars and the rooms above. Neighbours fought a losing battle using garden hoses on the blaze. 
Fears were held that someone was trapped inside. Smashed the window around the back, see if we could find anyone in there, but couldn't, nothing heard. So we just kept the hoses on there till the fireys came. The intensity of the flames made it difficult for firefighters to enter the house. The flooring inside was unsafe. It took us a while to um, go through each and search each room. Once the blaze was brought under control, firefighters were able to enter the garage. It was then they discovered the body. Well, shortly before 12.15 today, a motor vehicle was seen to drive into the garage here, and then shortly after that there was an explosion. And at this stage we can only say that there is a body in the garage. Police say there are no suspicious circumstances. The name of the man who died has not been released. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Police stopped the woman in her vehicle near Merriweather Beach. Police had followed the woman as she drove erratically at high speed from Stockton along Hanel Street at Wickham, past Nobby's along Memorial Drive and through suburban Merriweather. She was on the wrong side of the road on occasions that she was travelling at speeds up to 80 to 100 kilometres an hour uh, and that caused us grave concern. Police feared she could have killed someone. However, instead of matching her speed, they followed her, selecting the best time and place to stop the vehicle. We fear that serious injury could have been caused to the lady, the young child in the vehicle, or some other member of the public. On seeing the police blockade set up at the end of this street, she rammed it with her car. Fortunately, the unrestrained child in the front of the vehicle wasn't injured. The woman, believed to be from Tarot, was taken to the James Fletcher Hospital. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Six weeks ago, seven-year-old Jane Sidebottom broke his neck. The accident, which is now the subject of legal action, left him a quadriplegic. James is quadriplegic. That means his uh, spinal cord is not functioning. There's no transmission from his brain to his body at all. He's perfectly conscious, but he can't move and he can't breathe. James was in a Sydney hospital until yesterday when he was flown to the John Hunter Hospital to be closer to family and friends. It's um, been easier on James and I and it's more what we can call home until we do get home. James will remain in the John Hunter Hospital for up to 18 months. Then it's hoped he'll be able to go home. He'll need uh, life support systems, two of them, in case one breaks down. He'll need uh, wheelchairs, he'll need a house modified with ramps and baths and special equipment and he'll need nursing care. James' mum says visits from friends and family will make the stay in hospital easier. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Jack Glatzer is regarded as one of the world's finest musicians and his concert record proves it. Oh, I've played in the Edinburgh Festival and then in the Purcell Room in London, St. Martin's in the Fields and the National Arts Centre in, uh, uh, in Canada and in Ottawa and recently in Madrid. The Texan-born violinist now lives in Portugal, but spends most of his time performing around the world, sharing his passion for composer Paganini. He's the greatest violinist who ever lived. His music is the most challenging and most difficult music there is. It's pretty spooky and ghoulish, but it's very, very special, mysterious music and um, a mysterious, legendary figure that he was. 
While visiting the Hunter Valley's vineyards, the 55-year-old says he feels a special association when it comes to producing a final product of quality. It's really not unlike what these winemakers do, I'm sure, getting out in the hot sun and blending and, you know, and saying what, what will happen with this and never resting on their laurels. And maybe the wine and the violin come very close to each other that way, you know. Sixty-six-year-old George Woodcock was found murdered in his home in Weston in October 1990. For three years, police could find no leads on his killer. But in June last year, Judy Dunn came forward and said her de facto Trevor Burke had slain Mr Woodcock and threatened to kill her and her family if she didn't provide an alibi. Police subsequently charged Burke. However, today, Justice McInerney, who was sitting without a jury, found that Burke was not guilty of the crime. He said, the evidence and statements of the accused leave me with suspicions as to his involvement in this horrific crime, but suspicion is not enough. Mr Justice McInerney said the Crown's case relied upon the evidence of Judy Dunn. However, he believed her to be a person of unstable character who could not be relied upon to tell the truth. Justice McInerney said she had an overwhelming bias against the accused and was insanely jealous of a relationship he was having with her cousin. As the judgment was handed down, Burke sat in the dock without expression. Outside court, freed of the murder charge, he had this to say. Mr Woodcock's sister, Ruth Bailey, who sat through the trial, was overcome by the verdict. She believes justice has not been done. Jodie McKay, NBN News. Since it began 16 years ago, the Secondary Student Art Prize run by the Maitland City Art Gallery has provided a valuable opportunity for the region's young artists. They are able to show their work in a public arena. It's all very well to produce the work, but they really need to see their work on a wall or on a floor, but where people can see it and where it can stand up with work from other schools. Not 361 works were selected from 15 schools in the Maitland district, the colourful pieces covering all forms of visual art. We have 15 uh, sections. It includes sculpture, uh, wearable art, fibre, uh, paintings, drawings, um, ceramic art. But the works that impressed the judges were from a new category, chair expressions. Unable to choose between Chris Ackland's Unburied Bones and Aaron Kinane's Unnoticed, the two St Mary High students share the major prize. I think it's really rather wonderful because most of the chairs are using found objects and I think it's putting them in a very practical way. It's a sculptural form, a decorative form. It's, it's, it's really quite interesting to see what they've come up with.
the dispute fled this afternoon with the sacking of 23 people, the workers say they want better redundancy payouts. All 300 employees are on strike and a picket line is in place. People have just gotten to a stage where they can't cop anymore um, and it's, it's basically reverted into a dispute over redundancy because people have been threatened with their jobs on a number of occasions. The clothing manufacturer's managing director Peter Rundle admits that in May he asked workers to lift productivity to make the business viable, but he denies intimidating workers. The company has plenty of work, including a million dollar contract for Qantas uniforms. They've picked a time when we're very busy and have a lot of work on to uh, put industrial action on. In uh, 30 odd years this is the first time we've ever been picketed. As the picket line settles in, the company says it has offered workers better than award rates for redundancy payments. The union has promised to man the picket line until at least Wednesday when the strikers will meet to discuss their future. Soon ordinary people will don red noses to help raise money for research into sudden infant death syndrome or cot death. Newcastle's Lady Mayoress was today on hand to release more than 70 balloons, each carrying the name of a child who has died from the condition over the past five years. Different parents specifically wanted their um, child remembered that way, so yeah, it's a fairly emotional time. So far this year, four children from the region have died from SIDS. Since Red Nose Day began, the infant mortality rate has fallen by half. Two weeks away from being a father himself, the campaign had a special significance for night skipper Mark Sargent. We'll be taking the uh, precautions that have, uh, that have been suggested by um, the sudden infant death syndrome to, um, to ensure that that doesn't happen to us. Volunteers will be asking people to dig deep and buy a nose on the 26th of this month. We hope that uh, the, number of, the number of those balloons will reduce each year. Meanwhile, Saltash pilot Bob Turner was making last minute preparations today. Come tomorrow, he'll be flying to Amberley Air Force Base for a 6,000 kilometre tour of Queensland with a group of nine pilots. They're hoping to raise $20,000. During his 19-year career with the New South Wales Ambulance, paramedic Alan Playford has had to deal with all manner of emergencies, but never anything on the scale of the suffering in Rwanda. But he believes the skills paramedics use every day here can make a difference in a disaster zone. I've always felt uh, with the skills that the, uh, the ambulance officers have in this region that we could be of help in uh, disasters such as this. With another paramedic from Melbourne, Alan will operate a United Nations ambulance unit on the road between Goma and Rwanda's capital, Kigali. Ironically, in a country where the death rate has been overwhelming, it seems the two ambulance officers will be kept busy bringing new life into being. Uh, they asked me the other day how I was delivering babies. I said, well, I've delivered a few in the job. And they said, how do you feel about delivering 20 a week? So it sounds like a, a huge operation. With, and each team, I believe, is seeing 700 patients a day. Using his long service leave, Alan has volunteered for a three-month stint with Care Australia in Rwanda. He'll fly out from Australia on Thursday. The damage count levelled off today at 124 claims, 12 of those for buildings with serious structural damage. It was an early start for Minister Virginia Chadwick, the most badly affected property at Ellalong, a priority stop on her tour. But if Cessnock Council was hoping for a handout, it was to be disappointed. It isn't uh, declared a disaster area, uh, but uh, the, when you look at the services that are available through building services, through community services, uh, the, uh, I, I couldn't put a dollar value on it, uh, but the assistance is there. Uh, unfortunately no grants announced 
but uh, Council will be making claims both on the earthquake appeal and to the State Government for infrastructure. For the Chapmans, it seems certain their 10-year-old home will be demolished, but the quake hasn't shaken their resolve to rebuild. Cessnock Mayor Marie Callaghan earlier this week criticised the lack of response from the government following the quake. Today, Mrs Chadwick denied her visit was in any way prompted by the attack. Yeah, absolutely not, and I, and I would repeat that uh, the Department of Community Services and my colleague Wendy Machen through the Building Services Corporation, uh, they were very busy uh, from Saturday night and indeed from Sunday morning. Despite Mrs Chadwick's claim the government hadn't forgotten the area in the wake of the rural crisis, today's is only the second visit by a minister since the March elections three years ago. It took an earthquake to get the second ministerial visit since March 1991, uh, but it was good that she came. Joanne Shoebridge, NBN News. The idea is to see which bub can crawl to the outer circle the quickest and their eager parents try every trick in the book. While the babies are at first a little baffled by all the commotion, they soon catch on and the reward, a hug for the unimpressed bub and a bag of goodies for mum. Daybreak after another freezing night for the picketers and a cold reception for the strikers who decided to go back to work. About 20 of the 300 workers broke the picket today, management welcoming them back. Police looked on as the workers crossed the line under a barrage of criticism. The dispute started three days ago, workers angry over redundancy payments. 23 people were sacked, 300 went out in sympathy. Yesterday, management offered to put the workers back on with a new redundancy offer. The rank and file voted to maintain the strike. Yeah, we're doing it tough. We're doing it tough. And everybody here has got some sort of repayment to make and if this keeps going we can't make it, but that's the price we pay. The dispute is expected to go before the Industrial Relations Commission. Rundle's management is refusing to comment. Peter Ryan, NBN News.